Good morning. When you look at that, it doesn't take long to see that we live in turbulent times, does it? We live in times of chaos, whether we're talking about the election, whether you're talking about riots in the street, whether you're talking about terrorism. It only takes a few minutes of watching the nightly news to understand that we live in turmoil times. Times just consistent of of turbulence and, and hard times and difficult times to understand how to navigate them. Does anybody else just get tired of seeing the negative on the news every single day? Okay, good. That's why I don't watch it anymore. I just had to say, no, I can't watch it anymore. It's just not worth it. We live in times that are just full of chaos. And every day it's just more and more of this chaos. And it doesn't take long to see that sometimes in life we just have to put the seatbelts on and figure out how are we going to make it through it. So today we start this new series called Turbulence. What to do when you don't know what to do. How are you going to respond when the turbulent times of life come? Because make no mistake, we will all go through difficult, hard, turbulent times in life. You probably already experienced those in different ways. But when those times come, how are you going to respond? What is it that you're going to reach out for? What is it that you're going to hold on to? What are you going to do when those turbulent times come? So, you know, for me, um, my, my community group, I love my community group. I love being in a small group. It really is the heart of who we are as a church. And if you're not in a group, you're really missing something. We want every single person to be a part of a, a community group during this seven-week series. But for me, uh, our community group, we start almost every single week the exact same way. The very first thing that we do, well, maybe after having a cookie or a brownie or nachos or something, the first thing after that uh, is that I, I start with asking the question, what is it that, that shows that God is around you? What has happened this last week that just shows that God's at work in your life, in your family, in your marriage? What is it that God has shown that he is still present in our life. If you don't do that in your community group, I really encourage you to start with that question. I think we need to remember that in the middle of the negative news that God is still at work, right? We need to remember that God is still at work in our everyday, ordinary lives. And so it, it always plays out a little bit different. Sometimes it's just crickets. I'm going, okay, someone please answer something. You know, say something. I mean, someone spit out something. And other times, there, there's people that are just ready to, to, to spit something out. They're ready to tell what God has done. They've had a good week. God has shown himself, and they're excited to tell about it. I mean, maybe it's something as small as, you know, we've been worried about what kid or, or what teacher our kid would get. And when we got the list this week, we were just encouraged that God already took care of that. Some of you know that this week. You were kind of worried. You're going, what? Some of you teachers are going, all teachers are good. There's no bad teachers. Only bad students, right? But some of you are worried about what, what teacher your student would get. Other people come in and they'll say something like this. Um, Y'all have been praying for my mom and my mom got a good report from the oncologist this week. And that just shows that God's at work. Someone will say, you know, we've been praying for my grandpa and my grandpa's health is just deteriorating and I really appreciate y'all praying for him. When I visited him this week, he, he was really doing a lot better. Other people will say, you know, I was worried about losing my job. There's a chance I'm going to get laid off. And, and as of today, I still got a job. And so we're going to trust that God still has a plan. Maybe it's not even that big. Maybe it's small things. Is My kid went the entire first week of school and didn't get in trouble. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen, right? I mean, let's rejoice in that because that is a miracle. Other people say, you know, Tuesday morning, I was driving way too fast to work. I was doing everything I could to get there on time because I was overslept, and I, and I got pulled over, and I didn't get a ticket. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, right? I mean, whatever. Just that shows that God is at work, that we get to rejoice, that we can see that God is at work in all circumstances of life, and that we can have hope that he is not finished. I love hearing these type of stories because... I need to be reminded that God still works in ordinary lives like mine. I need to be reminded that God still works in ordinary people like me. I need to know and remember that God is still at work. No matter how difficult it is to see it in the chaos around us, that God is still at work. You know, normally, uh, our, our normal Sunday mornings and preaching, 
that what we would do is we would take a passage and we put it up on the screen and we would try to go through the passage and understand what does God, what is the truth that was being taught to that original audience? What is the truth that we need to learn? And then we would end it with some type of action item that, hey, here's what you do with the knowledge that you now have. And so instead of going through one passage today, we're going to go through several different verses, but all of them are going to be about the life of Peter. And so as we go through these verses, I encourage you to write those down, go back and read those stories later to understand all that was going on. I love Peter. Uh, Peter was one of the disciples. He was one of the first disciples that that were called to follow Jesus. And and I like Peter because Peter was bold. He was strong. And and what I like about Peter is he was 100%. I mean, Peter was always full, full go all the time, pedal to the metal, no slowing down, and then put your foot in your mouth. That's what I like about Peter. Maybe that's why I like Peter, because I do the exact same thing. Anybody else do that? You go 100 miles an hour, and then you end up putting your foot in your mouth because you said something you probably shouldn't be saying in that situation. All the time for me. All the t- way, too, way too often for me. But I like Peter because he's, he's going at it all the time, and then he, he is seeking after Christ. He's seeking after the things of God, and way too often he puts his foot in the mouth. So what we want to do today is we're going to look at a little bit of the life of Peter and how Peter would respond to the question, tell us something that shows that God's at work around you. And so, I, you know, thinking about it and just thinking about sitting in a home, thinking about sitting around with six, five, six, seven, eight other couples, and someone asks the question, hey, tell us something that shows that God's at work, <clears throat> excuse me, in your life and in the life around you this week. So if that was posed to you, Many of y'all could say, man, I'm ready. I could answer that question right now. How many people could just say, yeah, I could, I could say something that just shows that God's at work? Come on. Very good. Good. He is at work in all of our lives. It's just, are we aware of it? So I could see Peter going, you know, showing up for the first group and, and asking that question to Peter and going, yeah, man, I, could, I can answer that question. Let me tell you what happened to them, me this week. I was sitting in my boat. It's actually not my boat. It's my dad's boat. I mean, it's not as nice as John's boat over there. John's got the brand new 2016 model with every bell and whistle. We don't have that nice of a boat. But me and Andrew, my brother, we're sitting in this boat, and this man Jesus comes up to us. And he tells us that if we'll come follow him and leave all this behind, that he's going to make us fishers of men. Look what it says in Mark 1. And Jesus said to, to them, follow me, and I'll, I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. I can see Peter sitting in this circle going, man, you're not going to believe it. I know this sounds weird, but when this Jesus came to me and he said, follow me, there was nothing I could do about it. I had to follow him. It was so compelling. I wanted to know more about this Jesus. So I left it all behind and followed him. You go through your normal uh, community group meeting. You come back the next week. The leader asks the question again, hey, tell us something that shows that God's at work around you. And immediately... Peter speaks up again. Peter goes, man, you, you're not going to believe what happened this week. So I'm following this Jesus. A couple of us are, are walking with, the, with him. When we go into this temple, and, and Jesus is in this temple, and when he starts to teach, this man with his evil spirit, this demon-possessed man, runs to Jesus, and he knows who Jesus is. And he begins to call out to Jesus. And Jesus immediately responds and rebukes him, and tells the evil spirit to come out of him. Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out. And you know what happened? This man fell on the ground and began convulsing, and then he was healed. It was amazing. You should have been there. I hate that you weren't there to experience what God had had done when he healed this man. It was amazing. And you're going, okay. Go on with the next week. You get there, and everybody's going, all right, we know Peter's going to have a story, right? I mean, there's always someone... Let me give you a little insight. If you're not in a group right now, there will be someone in your group that talks too much. Okay? You're going to think that, man, I'm not sure if these people are cool enough to be in a group with me, but there will be one person in every single group that is the overtalker. All right? Peter would be the overtalker. He would come in, and you're going, all right, what kind of stories he got for us today? And Peter comes in and says, man, you're not going to believe this. It just gets, continues to get better. It continues to get better. This last week, Jesus was teaching. He was teaching up on this mountain, and there were like 5,000 people there. I mean, it's more like than the 10 o'clock service at Sea Life, okay? More than that. It was jam-packed. 
Well, let me clarify. There wasn't just 5,000 people there. There was 5,000 men plus women plus children. There's a ton of people. And we get to the end of the day, and, and Jesus, we tell Jesus, hey, Jesus, we got to feed these people. These people are going to be hungry. And when I look at Jesus and say, Jesus, there ain't no way CeCe's can fulfill this order. And we can't get enough chicken nuggets for all these people. It ain't going to happen. And Jesus looks at, at us, and he tells us, you find something for them to eat. What do you mean? How are we going to feed all these people? And Peter, being the bold one he is, he looks at all the, the other disciples and says, hey, guys, get to work. Figure it out. They all start scrambling, and they come back. And then think about Peter telling you the story. They come back with two fish and five pieces of bread. Peter's going, man, that's not enough for me to have a snack, much less fi feed 5,000 men. Are you kidding me? What are you supposed to do with this? But listen, this Jesus, he took this, these two fish and these five loaves of bread, and he blessed it, and he told us to start handing it out. And we started handing it out, and then we handed out more, and then we handed out more, and we handed out more, and we got to the end, and there was baskets full of food. Man, it was like eating some Dobelly's catfish and a red lobster biscuit. Someone's testifying there. I mean, it was good. God provided in a way that you would never have imagined. I mean, it was good. God took care of this, and we didn't even know how, but God provided. You throw out your group, and you have your discussion. You come back the next week, and you're going, all right, what kind of stories is Peter going to have for us this week? Hey, y'all tell us what God has done to show that he's at work in your life. Peter's just, you know, you can see him kind of twitching, just ready to tell a story. And you're going, all right, go ahead, Peter, tell us a story. He said, man, y'all ain't going to believe this. This last week, we were out in this boat, and we were like way out, and Jesus had sent us out in this boat, and we were going over to the other side, and Jesus stayed there. And in the middle of the night, we look out there, and these other disciples, there were a bunch of girls, and they were scared, thinking it was a ghost or something. And I looked out there, and I see Jesus walking across the water. And I knew it was Jesus. And, and so I called out, Jesus, is that really you? If that's really you, let me walk on the water with you. And you know what I did? I got out of that boat, and I started walking on water. Well, for a little bit until I started sinking. He said, you wouldn't believe it. It was amazing. God did the miraculous. I got to walk on water with Jesus. The next week he comes in and he says, listen, guys, I know I, every, every week is just a bigger story and, and more glamorous. and um, just." I know you probably think I'm just trying to one-up you, but this stuff is real. It only gets better. This last week, Jesus tells us that we're about to go to Jerusalem, and this will be our last trip to Jerusalem. But before we go to Jerusalem, he takes us up on this mountain, and we go up on this mountain, and, and, and we're there, and Jesus completely changes. He's bright, shining white. And with him is Moses and Elijah, these guys that have been dead for hundreds of years, and we're there, and I told him we ought to just stay here. Y'all ought to just build some tents. So let's just hang out here. And I put my foot in my mouth again. And then, you wouldn't believe it, this voice from heaven comes. God himself spoke to us on top of this mountain. And he says, this is my son. Do what he says. Listen to what he says. And Jesus went on to tell us that when we go to Jerusalem, that he's going to be crucified and he's going to be killed and he's going to rise from the dead. Next week comes, hey, where's Peter? I mean, I'm ready to hear kind of the end of the story. Where's Peter this week, right? Why didn't Peter show up for community group this week? Someone call him. I want to hear the story. Peter's going quiet. Peter's going silent. What happened to Peter? Peter doesn't want to tell what happens for the next few days there. And every one of us go through these times that we are able to rejoice. We're able to celebrate what God has done. We want to look back in our life and we want to remember where God's provided, right? We want to look back in our life and remember where we took our monthly bills and we spread out our monthly bills. We spread out our money. You saw that, right? We spread out our monthly bills and we spread out our money and we see how God provided we want to look back and see stories where God healed my mom or a brother, a friend of an addiction. He healed him of cancer. We want to look back and celebrate these good times that God did the miraculous. 
We want to look back and remember the times that, that God revealed something to us about himself, about his nature, about his character, and that he taught us something about how to follow him. And we want to say, listen, you are not going to believe what God taught me this week. We want to look back at our lives and see how God did the impossible. We want to look back and we want to celebrate. We want to, to remember all the, God, the good that God has done. But i got to remind you, this series isn't about remembering the good times. This is about turbulence. What are we going to do when turbulent times come? Because it's going to come. We need to remember. We need to rejoice. We need to celebrate all that God has done. But what are you going to do when turbulent times come in life? For the next three days, Peter was filled with doubt and uncertainty, fear. He wasn't sure what he was going to do. We'll come back to Peter in a minute. For my wife, Leslie, and I, we've had a chance to go on a few trips. And anytime we fly, it seems there's the same thing happens every time. We, we're coming back from a, on, on our trip. Everything's been going good. We're sitting there, and we're just kind of talking about how great the trip was and just kind of reminiscing. And all of a sudden, ding, put your seatbelt on, and rough, rough flight's coming. And I know what's about to happen. What's about to happen is my arm is going to start hurting as she begins to dig her claws into me. She's wrapped her arm around me, and she is squeezing me. And I look at her eyes, and her eyes are all big. And my eyes are just trying not to cry. I'm going, that hurts. Let go, please. This fight's going to be okay, but my arm, I'm not sure. And I look over her and try not to cry and, and try not to whine too much about it. I'm going, it's okay. It's, we're going to make it. It's going to be all right. Because I don't get nervous in those times. It just doesn't bother me. I've never been motion sick. I don't get scared during those times. I'm just not worried about it. And so I, became, I get to be a point of stability and strength for her during that time. I mean, honestly, I've looked at the brochure, and what it says to do, if it gets really bad, oxygen is going to fall down, put the mask on, lean forward, put your head between your legs, and you just kiss your ear and goodbye. <laughs> I mean, if the plane's going down, there ain't nothing to worry about. It's going to be all be good. Until this last March. This last March, myself and the Connection Pastors uh, from our other campuses, we're at a conference uh, in California. And the way back, the flight was really rough. It was like one of those flights that no one was really talking, no one was moving around, uh, the flight attendants weren't coming up and down the aisles. It was really, really rough. And I'm sitting there, and, and I'm just playing on my iPad, and Jared Douglas, who oversees our Kaufman campus, is sitting next to me and, and playing on my iPad, just playing a game there. And all of a sudden, I go, whew, that didn't feel good there. That was, that was a big drop. Oh, whew, I, I don't feel well. Things are not right. I cannot believe I'm going to be, oh, gosh. Jared, hold my iPad. And I go to stand up thinking, I've got to get to the back of the plane right now. I mean, like, right now, I've got to get back there. I stand up, almost fall on this lady over here, thinking I'm going to throw up all over her, throw up all over the floor, fall on the floor. I can't stand up. This plane's bouncing all over the place, and I think, I've got to be able to sit back down because I can't get back to the back, and I go to sit back down, and Jared Douglas must have seen, like, the green look on my face, and he is frantically digging through the seat back in front of him, <laughs> frantically, going through there, and he pulls out this little paper bag about this big and goes, here, <laughs> I'm going, but that ain't going to handle it. That is not going to work. Now, luckily, for myself and every other person on that flight, we were able to land smoothly without myself or anybody else getting sick on that flight. But it was rough. And what I realized there was the, the part of my life that had been a strength, the part of my life that had been stable, the part of my life that I was able to provide strength for others was now a weakness. And I had no control over it. And that same thing happens for our life. The thing that we think is strong in our life gets knocked off kilter. And how are we going to respond? How are we going to respond? What are we going to reach for? What are we going to hold on to when those crazy times of life come? What are you going to do? What happens when God doesn't show up when you need him to show up? 
What happened? I mean, we all want God to show up on our schedule, on our time, and do it how we think, right? But what happens when God doesn't show up on our schedule? What happens when he doesn't obey my demands? I mean, I mean, my prayer request. What happens when I need God to show up today and rescue me from this situation and he does nothing? What happens when I beg God to do something and he remains silent? What happens when God is disobedient to my will? That's what I said, when God's disobedient, because I have a plan for God, right? We all have a plan for what we think God should do, but what happens when he doesn't do what I think he should do? What will you hold on to? What are you going to do during those times? See, the truth is that attitude, that mentality reveals that we weren't looking for God to be king and savior and lord of our life. We were looking for God to be a consultant. We were looking for God to be a partner or an advisor to help us when we need him, to be a genie in the bottle that when God, when I need you, I need you to show up, but not really being lord of my life. Let me see if I can illustrate this way. I need, I need a volunteer. Chase. <laughs> Chase, would you come on up here for me? Y'all give it up for Chase as he comes up here. Here's what we're going to do. Chase, come sit right over here on the stool. You're, you're center stage, bud. Right here. Okay. Scoot up a little bit. All right, that's good. No, no, that's not that far. What are you doing? Come on, right here. All right, there you go. All right, so here's what we're going to do. Here's, for today, Chase, you're going to be God. Okay. Okay? <laughs> Some of y'all over here don't feel like that's a pretty big stretch, all right? Understandable. But for, for, for the next few minutes, Chase, you're going to be God. And so here's how we respond to God. God, I want you to be on the throne of my life. You sit there on your throne. You're king of my life. God, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. You want me to host a group? God, I'll, I'll host a group. I'll text that number right now, and I will host a group. I'll step on on faith. I'm scared, but I'll trust you. God, you want me to go to Ghana? I'll go to Ghana. God, you want me to teach third grade? God, whatever you want, I'll do that. And so whatever you want, God, you, you're on the throne. You know, God, things have been going pretty good. God, God, things have been going. Oh, just, just, get over, just get over just a little. Hey, where, where are you going? Sit back on your throne. No, okay, God. So, you know, God, things have been going pretty good in life. And I really appreciate how, how you've been taking care of me. And, and, and God, you, you, you know, you've been doing really good. And things are, are going really well in life. And you're doing a, a great job. Wait, what? My boss wants to talk to me on Friday afternoon. I'm going to get laid off. I'm gonna lose. God, you better get back on your throne. Get back on, get on your throne. Sit there, God. I need you to take care of this. I can't lose my job, God. I got kids to take care of. I got a wife to take care of. God, I can't lose my job. You got to be on, God, you take care of this. God, thank you. I got, got an interview. I got a job, or a new job. God, thank you for taking care of me in that. I appreciate it, God. You're doing such a, I got a new job. I got a raise. I got benefits, I got insurance, I got it all. God, I got a new office. Man, God, you are doing a great job. God, thank you so much uh, for taking care of me. I, I, I really appreciate, where are, you, where are you going, God? I mean, you sit on your throne. I mean, don't, go ahead and sit, sit down, God. No, okay, God, so, what? I, you know, God, things are, God, things are going really good right now. And God, I really appreciate all that you're doing and how you're taking care of me and how you provided a new job. My head's hurting. My head's been hurting for a few days. My head really hurts. Oh my goodness, I got a tumor. Sit down, God, get on your throne. I can't have a tumor. Oh my goodness, my, my head hurts. I've got a brain tumor. Oh my goodness, what am I going to do? God, you better get on your throne. You better do something. Jesus, help me. Help me do something, Jesus. You've got to rescue me from this. Oh, test results came back. I just had a sinus infection. <laughs> God, get on your throne. Where are you going? God, come on, God. Take care of things. Sit on your throne. Do things right, okay? I'll, I'll let you know when I want you to move. <laughs> Man, God, I really appreciate you taking care of that and just have a sinus infection. I'm all better now. You know, good, things are going pretty, pretty good in life, God. And so, you know, God, what, um, what, I know you're stronger than me, okay, God? (laughs) 
But God, but God I, I've been single for a long time. You know, it didn't really happen like I thought it was going to happen. And I've been single for a long time. And so, God, I want you to bless her relationship, but, I, but don't worry about it. I'll go find her. I mean, I'll, I'll go t- find her, and, and, and I'll make it work. God, you see Christy over here? We got it going on. And Christy's got it going on. We got it going on. We're pretty awesome together. I mean, look at us. We look great together. Things are going really well. I mean, we're leading a community group together. I mean, things are going well. Christy's crazy, God. Get on your throne. Christy is nuts. She is crazy. God, did you not know she's crazy? How did you not know? She is crazy. That was a close one, God. What are we going to do? Are you going to let me go all the way with that? Woo. She is nuts. You better, whew, God, you got to warn somebody else about her. All right? God, I mean, take care of me. You got you to warn me on those kind of things. And I know what you're thinking. I've been in church all my life. I would never try to take God off his throne. I mean, I know better. I, I know that that's not my place, that God's supposed to sit on the throne, and I can really never sit on God's throne. I, I could never do that. I've been to seminary, and I haven't missed Sunday school since I was three months old. I come to church every single week. I got every gold star the church can give out. I've got it all. I've done, I would never do that. But what we want to do is, God, just, just, no, 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 just, just right there. No, just stay right there. I just, I just want a little bit of cheek on there, God. All right. A oh, little, little, bit, little bit more right there. All right. Hold on. Ooh, I'm sorry to hold your knee like that. <laughs> just, give, just give me just a little bit of cheek, God, okay? I just want a little bit. It's still going to hold us. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I just want a little bit, God. I just want a little bit of the control. God, now listen, I've got my, my finances in order. I've got my business in order. I know how to run these areas of my life. These are all smooth. These are going good. But God, I need you to, I mean, that part, with my kids, my kids are crazy, so I need some help with my kids. God, I need you to keep me healthy so I can take care of these things. God, I need you to take care of these areas of my life because I got these taken care of on my own. And the problem is we think God is our partner. We think God is there to help us out. That God is just there as a consultant. And when we begin to believe that, we fail to see that Jesus did not go to the cross in order to be your partner or your consultant. He rose from the dead because he is God. That he is Lord alone and that he alone has the power and the authority over my life and all the world. So why do we think we need to hold on to a little bit of power, a little bit. Just, just give me a little bit. No taking pictures of this, no tweets, no Facebook post of this right here, okay? Just, just give me a little bit, God. Why is it that we think we want a little? Chase, thank you for your help, bud. You can go sit down. Y'all give it up for Chase. He didn't die to be our consultant, a partner, He died to provide a way that we would have a a way to God, that we would have a a way to know God personally and have a relationship with him. What happened to Peter? Here's what happened to Peter, this bold, strong man, 100% all the way, all the time. Jesus arrested. Jesus handed over to the Romans to be crucified. And what does Peter do? No, I don't know who that guy is. Never met him before in my life. Jesus who? And he denies him three times. Well, after, Je- after Peter denies Jesus three times, he goes and hides for the next three days. He hides and gets away. And he trades in. He trades in what, to see all that God has done. He traded in his front row view to see the Son of God at work. He traded in for doubt and fear. In the Old Testament, the people of Israel, they traded in real worship, seeing God at work to something that was tangible that they could hold on to. They traded in for a golden calf. They could reach out and say, oh, that will be my God. That will be my security. King David, instead of leading the people of Israel, he trades in 
his authority to be king and to be the representative of God to the people for an affair with a married woman. And way too often in our lives, we trade in the real thing for that which is fake. We give up what is real, what has strength, what has stability for a small little trinket. We trade it in for a faith that will never suffice. It will never do what God can, alone can do. And we think we, if we can just hold on to this, it will provide security. If we can just hold on to this, it will provide peace. And they were never intended to do that. Let me ask you this. How many of y'all have an alarm system in your homes? Okay, quite a few of y'all. We have an alarm system in our home, and I know we do because there's this little keypad by the back door. I don't know what it does. It doesn't work. It doesn't do anything, but it's there, I guess. You can go and have a security company come out to your house, and they can sell you every bell and whistle possible. And they are going to tell you that if you buy their security alarm, it's going to bring peace. That you will have this peace knowing that all your stuff is taken care of. And you can have the top-of-the-line security system. You can have it where it monitors your doors, your windows, and a five-foot perimeter all the way around your house. You can have it where you can log on to your iPad or your phone, and you can see camera views of every angle, of every corner, inside and out of your house. You can have it where you push one button, and it calls the police department. You push the next button, and it calls the fire department. You, call the, you push the next button, and it calls the Marines. You push the next button and it calls SEAL Team 6. It doesn't matter who it is. You push the button and that they're coming. They're coming to provide you security. But let me tell you this. You're lying in bed at 3 o'clock in the morning, snoring away, and you hear beep, 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 beep. There's no peace to be found. You're not going to find peace at that moment. What you're going to find is pushing your wife out of the bed, telling her to go search the house. <laughs> because a security system cannot bring peace. It's made to bring security, not peace. And we reach for things that, are, that we think will do what only God can do. We want security in, in, our, in our society. We want things to hold us together and to provide strength that we will reach to in this will be strength in turbulent times. This will be our hope in turbulent times. We reach for things like our marriage, our health, our job, our 401k, our sex life, our, our kids, our kids' future, that all of these things will bring us something. And none of them were intended to bring what only God can bring. The, none of those things can bring strength. When that ding Better put on your seatbelt. Rough times are coming. God alone can do that. Nothing else will satisfy. He alone is able. Look what it says in Romans chapter 1. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. He is not your partner. He is not a consultant. He is God. And to try to trade him in for anything less is just change, trading out the real thing for a 25-cent trinket. And it doesn't matter how big and how strong you think it is. It will never satisfy. When turbulent times come, here's my challenge to you today, that you would reach to the one God who really is your strength. That you would reach to him to know that he is able. And that you would know that at the same time he is reaching and holding and strengthening you through those turbulent times. Here's one of my favorite things in, in the Bible. Peter has been hiding for three days. And it's the, it's the Sabbath, it's Sunday morning. It's the very first Easter. Jesus has been in the grave, and Mary and some of the other ladies, they rush to the tomb that morning. And when they get to the tomb, the huge stone has been rolled away. And they go inside, and they find that Jesus isn't there, but instead of Jesus, there's this angel inside. And they're, they're scared, and they're worried about what's going to happen. And look what it says. 
And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go. Tell his disciples. Man, this is the part I love. Because this is Nick where Nick puts his foot in his mouth. Nick doubts. I have fear. I have anxiety. I just don't know how I'm going to make it through. Go tell his disciples and Peter. The guy who denied him. The guy that was scared of a teenage girl. The guy who went and hid in a room for three days. Go tell Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. The same Savior who is not done with Peter is not done with you. The same Savior who rose from the dead and says, Peter, I'm not finished with you. I know what you've done. I know how you've denied me. I know how you were scared. I'm not done with you. And there's people in this room, most of us, who have denied, who have been afraid, who have been so consumed with anxiety that you're reaching for anything. Instead of the one thing that has the strength when turbulent times come, will you reach? Will you hold on? Will you find strength in the one God who is able to see you through, to hold you through, and to show that he is not finished with you? It was Peter who went on to lead the church. It was Peter who went on to preach at Pentecost to see thousands and thousands of people come to know Christ. It was Peter who led the church in so many different ways because God was not finished with him and I want you to know he is not finished with you. Hold on to the one who's holding on to you through the turbulent times of, God, of life. Hold on to him, reach for him. He is not finished. The band's gonna lead us in a song and maybe you need to stand and rejoice and worship. Maybe you need to sit there quietly and just go, God, I know that I've been reaching for things that are not real and that cannot satisfy. So God, give me strength and faith to reach for you. Others of you just need to sit quietly. Maybe you need to pray. Maybe you need to stand and, re and rejoice. This is your time to respond to God, that you would reach to him, hold on to him, because he is able. God, thank you. God, thank you that... You are strong enough to handle all the turbulence of our life and that you have plans and purpose for each and every one of them and for each and every one of us. God, give us faith to hold on to you, to trust you, and to seek you through the most turbulent times of life. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.